Hi, everyone. I just wanted to welcome you to this week's Take 30 Thursday. Um, today, we are going to talk about advanced analytics for higher ed and how to create data-driven insight throughout the whole education life cycle. Cycle. I'm joined today um, by with Nick Holmes. He's with IBM and he is the CTO of Data and AI. And Paul Hardy from Ironside, who is the EVP in professional services. Um, just wanted to remind everyone that throughout the session, feel free to um, type in some questions in the QA and we will get to them at the end of the 30 minutes. Thanks. And with that, I'm going to send it, pass it off to Nick. Oh. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you for having me. Let's go to uh, the next slide, shall we? So what we what we depicted here, right, is a very simple decomposition of what we consider to be the education life cycle. And everything that we've been trying to do when we're talking with different customers and working with different clients is looking at entry points where we can use data and AI and technology to really help make a difference. We're talking about AI from the standpoint of augmented intelligence, not sort of like true artificial intelligence, because we always want the humans in the loop. And as we sort of look at this entire education lifecycle, right, we've got recruiting all the way through the application process, as you go through admissions, and then you actually get into the university. Um, and then as you go and spend your time in your career, then you're, you're obviously learning, you're being supported. Then hopefully at the end of the day, you know, you kind of graduate and you go off and become wildly successful. So you think about that, those are the major building blocks that you've got within the, um, the education life cycle. Underneath, right, you know, we can't have AI, we can't have any of that, right, without any data. And so what we've got there is just some very common systems that we've seen as we go from institution to institution. As you can see, there's a lot of a lot, a lot of potential systems that you could be working with, right? So in any one of those in individual verticals, you would be wanting to say, hey, look, what am I going to do with the data, right? If I've got data, I may have too much data, but how do I actually, you know, use that data to actually create meaningful and actionable outcomes? And the way that we look at the world, right, is very simply, I've got to collect the data, I've got to organize it, I've got to analyze it. And then once I get that analysis, I want to infuse it into my business process. Um, how we do that is we use our platform. Um, it's called Cloud Pack for Data. It enables us to do that very, very quickly um, and very simply is to really connect to those different data sources. Now, once again, we're not looking to rip and replace. We're not looking to change any of those backend source uh, systems of record or those sources of data. But what we want to do is we want to say, look at an individual and we want to then be looking at all the data elements that are applicable to them. So we can then do our level of analysis. And so that's where we see, you know, our technology plus the, um, the institution's technology coming together very nicely um, and being able for us to create some very good use cases. So next slide, right, is as we go through the different use cases, this is one way that we were looking and saying, okay, look, you know, I've got all those systems of record that are providing us with a ton of really, really useful information. But what are the problems we're trying to solve, right? And if you take half a step back and if you talk to any of the, the sort of folks within the institutions, these are the types of problems that they've got. These are the types of problems that they're asking us to solve, right? So from a recruiting standpoint, we're hearing a lot of conversation around, hey, look, I've got marketing dollars. I want to spend those marketing dollars just as well as I possibly can. I want to spend them efficiently. I want to make sure that I'm optimizing how those marketing dollars then translate into people being recruited, right? So great, great, great use case there, you know, if you're in that sort of like marketing area of the organization. Then you've got the, the application process. A lot of people are very automated these days as they go into the application process. I do still see a lot of paper. So to me, that's another great use case, right? Where we can say, hey, look, you know, I've got 30,000 applicants. I've got 100,000 applicants. How many applicants you've got? What are you doing in terms of making it easy for them? Because that's how people are going to ultimately make their decisions, right? Is how easy is it for me to be able to, to get from point A to point C in everything that I'm looking to do? If I can automate that, then once again, that provides me a really, really rich source of data. What are you going to do with that rich source of data? Well, you know, one of the things that we're in lots of conversations around 
with boards of education is around um, you know, scholarships. So if I'm going to award a scholarship to my good friend, Paul, I want to make sure that I'm doing that in a very ethical and very transparent manner, right? Because, you know, part of the way I'm going to attract him from my marketing, and now that I've got this great automated process that he's now going to be following, I'm going to be giving him perhaps some scholarship money. And I want there to be completely no, no question about why I'm giving Paul the money versus, you know, giving Sarah the money or Debbie the money. So we want to make sure that we're using very transparent AI and machine learning models as we're doing that sort of admissions process. And now Paul is like, you know, thankfully he's, he's agreed to join us. He's gonna be part of our institution. And of course I want him to be successful. So as you saw, there were a ton, a ton, a ton of like information systems that were coming along because as the administrator, um, Debbie is our administrator, right? Of the, of the school. What she doesn't wanna do is she wants Paul to, to graduate. She wants Paul to be able to work through all of his classes she wants him to have a very happy experience, a very good experience. And we don't want him, him to drop out. If Paul was to drop out, there's obviously the financial implications to the university and the institution, but there's also the reputational pieces. It also very much has a big impact on sort of like overall rankings when you're looking at retention. So we really wanna make sure that, you know, Paul continues all the way through his journey, gets through to graduation. As he graduates, we then of course want him to become a very, you know, rich and successful alumni so that we can then tap him on the shoulder and ask him for some money, you know, in terms of like feeding money and uh, back into the recruiting process for us. We want him to be the person that advocates for the university, right? So, and then across the top, we've got, you know, folks like Sarah and Tom and Sarah and Tom are our faculty, right? Um, if we have a lot of turnover, if we're not really looking at, you know, why is why is Paul really successful in some classes versus other classes? Maybe we could be looking at, you know, the faculty and the teachers and saying, hey, look, maybe we have a problem. Maybe we need some extra counseling. Maybe we need to be supporting Sarah in a way that she can actually be successful in her teaching career. Um, teacher turnover um, is, is really, really problematic for everyone, right? I mean, you then got to go through the entire cost of hiring new people, bringing them on board, getting them up to speed having them become useful members of your faculty so looking at sort of things from that faculty retention we think is a really really key consideration that we're looking at and so as we've gone through many 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 conversations with different institutions around the world these are some of the entry points right that are tied to the problems that we're hearing depending upon where you are and where you're sitting so all the data that we're going to be collecting all that collecting organizing analyzing and infusing it's all all about solving these particular use cases and then making sure that, you know, as the outcome, we're learning what we did wrong, we're learning what we could do better and then infusing that back into our business process. Let's go to the next slide if we could. So if we think about all those different entry points, right? Um, we, we obviously, you know, for us to be able to do any type of machine learning or any type of analysis, we really got to be thinking about the data that we're going to be looking at, right? Um, and so one of the perspectives that we've taken is really starting to think about it from a very personal standpoint. So, you know, I've actually forgotten who all my roles were on this one, but I think Paul was the student, right? So if I put Paul as the center of gravity, what are all the things that are going to be impacting Paul and Paul's success? Obviously, you know, where we've seen lots of institutions, they gravitate down to grades, they gravitate down to the student information system, they graduate down to the courses that people are taking. And what I think we're starting to see, especially in this post-COVID world, right, is that that's just not always the case. Those are not always going to be the influences that are going to be driving Paul's decision as to whether he's going to stay within the institution or whether he's going to leave, whether he's going to be successful or whether he's not going to be successful. So we started to look at this from a much more holistic, holistic manner. So we're looking at all of Paul, right? So we're looking at his mental well-being. We're looking at his prospects. We're looking at what are those extracurricular activities that he's doing and that he's involved in. Getting that sense of community will then, you know, sort of encourage him to stick around as we're as we're looking through this. So changing that paradigm a little bit enables us to then start looking at these other factors. In the past, most people I think have ignored them because it's just too difficult to collect the information and to organize the information. Imagine doing all of these different like data points and all these different indicators 
across your entire student population. All of a sudden, what seems like pretty reasonable when I show it on a slide like this, gives you a massive headache, right? But that's where the tools come in. That's where the tools come in, where the platforms come in that enable you to spend all, not all of your time collecting and organizing the data, but actually doing the analysis that you want to create those customized learning paths to make sure that Paul is being successful. Flip over a little bit to, um, I think Debbie was our administrator and Sarah was our educator. So Sarah is our educator, right? She's a new teacher. She just graduated quite recently. She's just getting involved in, in what she's doing. Um, she's having a good time. She's really like, you know, the classroom enjoys having Sarah around. We enjoy having Sarah around. How do we support her, right? So we want Sarah to be successful from a teacher standpoint, from an educator standpoint. And so we're looking at all these different factors, right? What are the, the financial prospects for, for Sarah? What are the promotion prospects for Sarah? What are the results that, that we're, getting, we're getting, you know, from Sarah's workload? So all of these different pieces help build that picture of what we should be doing for the educator, in this case, Sarah. And of course, we had another educator like Tom, for example, it could be very different. So creating those customized ways of looking at allows us to then provide very specific recommendations and very specific outcomes. Then the final step in the journey where we're having lots of conversations is at that institutional level, right? So that institutional level's got a ton, a ton, a ton of different factors that they're worried about. I mean, they're worried about retention, right? They're worried about their student rankings. One of our clients wants to be within the top 100 universities in the States. What can he do? What can he influence? What is important to be able to get him to cross that line? And at every single one of these steps, right, it's all about, for us, it's all about the data. It's all about providing technology to help close those gaps, right? Next slide. So where have we done this? And what are some of the stories that we've got that, that you could be using as you sort of go into these conversations? If you could just go down one more, please, Paul, right? So every single one of those use cases that we've explained, um, we do have some really good use cases, right? We have some really good use cases. We have some really good stories. We have some really good sort of like um, information that you can see. All of this comes out of our Cloud for Data platform when it comes down to faculty retention. You know, and what we've done is we've really sort of learned lessons from industry. We've learned lessons from our other clients and said, hey, look, there's no reason we couldn't apply this in education. So that way you're not relying upon your gut instinct. You're not relying upon, you know, other strategies, but you're using data to drive those approaches. You're providing those very customized plans about you know, who you should retain, why you should retain them, exactly what are the levers that you can pull to help retain people. And looking at it more holistically, looking at it from a programmatic standpoint, you can compare department from department, you can compare, compare school to school, you can look at things from a holistic standpoint or all the way down to the individual standpoint. Once again, all relying upon the data that we've got. Next slide, please. And then this one, this story that we've got next on this one um, around student success, you know, we're talking a lot about engagement, especially in this sort of COVID world that we're looking at. One of the keys has been, how do I continue to engage with my students? Everyone is using cell phones these days, right? Everyone, you know, all the, the students and all the faculty. So one of the things that we did is we built this virtual assistant, right? When we were in COVID world, what's open, what's closed? What are the rules? What should I be doing? What shouldn't I be doing? Um, all of that information we provided through a, a virtual assistant that's available on people's phones. You can send information, you can get information very readily, and you can also track engagement. Engagement becomes very important for us when we're looking at student success. Those were some of the key findings that we found, right, was that the more engaged the student in extracurricular activities, for example, that drives people wanting to stay within the institution. It's a very big driver when it comes down to attracting people. But it's also a very big driver when it comes down to retaining people. Those are some of the insights that, you know, you've got your obvious insights that you're gonna get from your student information system. If you use that with other data sources, you get those non-obvious insights. And that's how we make sure that Paul is actually gonna be a very successful, you know, student. He's gonna graduate. He's gonna go work at this wonderful company called Ironside. And he's gonna to get to basically talk to you, you guys today. So, that's really the student journey that we've got. So I'm going to hand over to Paul to tell some stories as well of some of the stuff that you guys have been involved in. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. And, and I feel both wealthier for having my scholarship and well-supported by uh, <laughs> my institution. So I appreciate that. 
Well, of course, Brilliant. if those things were true, what uh, every institution would be interested in is what I then become a, uh, a donor back to the institution. Uh, and at Ironside, we have worked on multiple use cases in higher education. This is with a large uh, state um, institution in the Midwest. And their issue was, as every institution has in their advancement organizations, is how do we improve um, our alumni donations, right? Both in terms of uh, outcome, into, meaning the dollars you're able to raise, as well as how you get it done and your productivity. So <clears throat> this was an institution where we built a predictive model of both alumni and other prospects um, with the objective, of course, increasing uh, their major donations, right? Who were the exceptional donors that you might find that perhaps were not even alumni, as well as the annual giving from, uh, from the rest of, uh, uh, of your uh, philanthropic pool. So uh, this is a very interesting model. These are sort of wireframes taken from that model, but you know, this model incorporated uh, over 170 variables to create an affinity score, right? So every um, uh, potential donor would be scored based on a variety of factors, 170 factors. So as you can imagine, it also involved then what we call data enrichment. So using external data that was, you know, we, we looked at all the data systems uh, that Nick talked about across the different uh, life cycle of a higher education institution. And many of those can be further enhanced with, uh, with outside data and certainly looking at um, the economic capabilities of your alumni is one of those. So this was uh, a use case where we did that. The return on investment here um, was just based on productivity was 55% ROI. So that's excluding the actual increases in donations themselves because the automation uh, allowed faster cycle time, better data quality, better decision-making, um, not just within the advancement, but within the educational departments that were involved in, in engaging their alumni in different campaigns. So really terrific, uh, terrific use case there that, uh, um, you know, integrated data from multiple parts of the, of the institution and externally and, and created real results. I'll talk about one other here. So this is another one of these uh, use cases that Nick identified going across that life cycle on the front end, optimized marketing and recruitment, right? We, we always think about enrollment as being the, uh, the revenue center for higher education. And so um, it's, a, it's also a place full with, uh, with lots of data resources. So it's a great place to go to find use cases. In this case, this was a use case that grew out of um, a piece of data strategy work that we had done for this particular institution. This is a Northeastern top 40 uh, large private institution. And uh, the use case here was one of many we identified during the straight data strategy work on the order of 30 different AI-based use cases. But one of the things we wanted to do was get something done fast, create the win, show the proof case that, that AI is, is, uh, is productive. And um, the institution had other AI use cases they were working on, but not this particular one. And this was one that was actually, we were able to create pretty quickly. And the question, as you can see listed there, was to whom and how should we target loyalty offers? right, to re-engage for advanced degrees. So uh, the name of this program was called the double, I'll call it the double mascot program uh, for this inst institution, use their own mascot there as any of you could. Um, but the idea was very simply to look at, you know, and train the model on historic data <clears throat> about uh, the time frame in which alumni were, were most likely to come back. What would they come back to in terms of what, uh, what graduate degrees uh, met most closely with um, the history of, uh, of their undergraduate degrees. This integrated data or could integrate data in the pilot, we were not able to do this, but the next step for this, for this would be to include things like their educational success during the time that they were here. This was looking at folks that were both in their junior and senior years, because you can begin marketing there, as well as alumni of different years past. And what we're able to do is actually produce a propensity score as to who would be uh, the right types of folks to, uh, to contact on that topic. So, um, so yeah, another terrific use case that, that again, integrates data from all of the multiple systems across the university. Um, and that's where the real power of, of uh, machine learning is, is going to be developed. So. That's a great story, Paul. That really is a great story. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to talk about then was, was just very quickly, and um, my apologies for all the automation here, did not know, or animation. Just, you know, how, the, the point even in that last example was that it was done, it was done quickly. It was actually done as a pilot during the course of doing a piece of data strategy work. Again, we're, you know, we're all students of change management. So the question was, how do you generate success? And, and if you can create um, these types of use cases very quickly, um, that's really going to help 
you know, move your initiatives along. So we do that in a way that we call a sent AI, we call data science as a service, meaning that um, you know, we're able to use our data scientists and our platforms to ingest your data and do the analyses you know, very quickly without it being invasive to your organization. And um, you know, this is something that we do uh, all the way from, as you see, use case discovery through to full implementation of, of AI use cases. So um, I will say that the way this typically starts out is with the two boxes you see on the lower left there, a use case discovery component, and then something we call a rapid viability assessment, which simply says that if you find uh, use cases and we help you do that, um, and we help you prioritize those in terms of the return on investment you'll get and the viability of your data uh, to conduct the use case. And then what we'll do is in an RVA is test it for signal. So once you know that you have data that's going to produce um, you know, a correlative outcome for you, um, then you can proceed through, uh, through the other stages of uh, data science as a service. But, uh, but the message here really is it's something that uh, you can start out with use case discovery or something where you have a use case already in mind and you can simply rapidly test whether there is signal in that data, uh, but you can do that reasonably quickly and, and inexpensively to get started. So Nick, any uh, additional closing, closing thoughts? No, I think this is, this is a brilliant approach, right? I mean, like you said, you start with the use cases. You could use one of the use cases that we talked about, right? Um, you know, those are, those are the typical pain points that we've seen, that we've heard um, when you're engaging with your client. You know, you've always used that as the, um, as the entry point. And then quite often they'll say, hey, yeah, that's kind of interesting. And I kind of get that, but it would be cool if, right? Which is probably, Paul, where you came up with that last use case, right? You're talking to the client about one particular use case. They're like, well, hold on a second. That's great. But my actual problem is going to be over here. So then you can sort of switch using that, this, this great, you know, RVA approach that you, you guys have outlined here. Right, yeah, and the use case discovery is extremely productive for that reason, because um, one of the, uh, Nick, I'm, I don't know if you see this very often, but one of the issues that we often confront um, is, and it's very difficult in higher education because typically it's such a federated organization, right? Lots of different uh, groups with lots of different power structures. Um, and one of the questions that always arises is, you know, boy, we don't, is our, is our data good enough? And you know we're two years away from fixing our data warehouse. We really can't do machine learning yet. That's down the road somewhere. And and really, what we find in use case discovery is that um, is that the 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 functions within the university are really ready to go already with great use case ideas. And um, they fear this notion of the data not being adequate. And so what we do is parse that and say, well, let's pick the specific use case and check just that data. You don't have to solve all of your data quality problems across the institution, which is, is very challenging in higher education, right? So let's just look at the use cases that have good return. Let's check the data for those use cases. And you can get started on a pilot as we did in the, in the examples that I showed, but without having every piece of data in the university be you know, in pristine condition, so. No, and I, I think that, that aligns to another question I hear a lot, right? Which is like, oh, this is gonna be really expensive for me, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, if you're going to be embarking on a two to three year journey with data warehouses and this, that and the other, right, then yeah, I mean, that's going to be quite a cumbersome project that you're going to be getting involved in, right? But I think, I think one of the, the big sort of myths that I try and dispel is, look, you can get started quickly, you can get started easily, you can, you know, jump on that sort of like AI and ML journey without it being hugely expensive, without it being massively onerous, right? Um, and, and really my, my sort of plea, if you will, is uh, look, just get started, right? I mean, there's no, there's no harm in dipping your toes in the water. Like your third bullet says, right? Fail fast. You know, we think, think big, start small, scale fast, fail fast, right? I mean, you might pick a terrible use case. We'll obviously help guide you. And so we don't hopefully do that. But, you know, getting started, I think, is always one of those ones where people always have that sort of like anticipation and it's hard for them to sort of like move forward. But just dip your toes in the water. It's really not that difficult to do. And, you know, we've got lots of experience, right, to help guide you to find a use case that is going to be valuable to you, right? And just think about it, right? I mean, we were talking before the call, right? Um, if you save just one student, you know, I mean, university costs are really expensive, right? What were you kicking around, like $20,000 or something? We only need to save one, five students, right? And that pays for this entire process, right? We're not looking at, like, huge numbers, but the value that you can get is very quick and it's very easy. Absolutely. 
Nick, um, Nick and Paul, we do have a question that I'd love to just interject, and it has to do with this journey and who is responsible for generating the data sets that's used in the AI models and how, and if, are they client provided? Are they directly feeding into the Ironside system or what point during this journey is that interaction, inter integration? Um, I guess I would respond that it can be done uh, in multiple ways, we have worked with, we we have a data platform, a cloud data platform that we use. Um, we have relationships with third party data providers that allow us to very quickly, um, you know, we've already gone through all the procurement cycles and have all the relationships so that, and, and understand all of the data sets that are available out there in the world. And we can quickly integrate those into use cases into you know, our own cloud data platform. However, we have many examples where we've actually worked within clients' platforms um, as well. The, the difference being that if we're able to ingest your data into our system, it's just less invasive you know, uh, for your people and your projects and in your world, um, and easier for our data scientists to perhaps you know, move a little bit faster, if you will. But um, there, there are no hard and fast rules there. And in terms of when do we uh, discover that data, actually way back in use case discovery, when we're looking at, you know, we, we are business case led first. So we look at use cases first, look for the ones where there's good ROI, um, and then understand what data would be necessary as features in those machine learning models, and then look specifically at those and see if there's adequate, as it says here, quantity, quality, variability um, of that data. And if that's true, then you can move to RVA and test for signal. And you see all of these gates, the gates are there very purposefully because what you, know, you, you wanna, as it says, fail fast, fail cheap. And the thing about machine learning that's different than many other types of projects is you can do everything right and the machine learning case still fails simply because the data doesn't have signal, right? So you wanna check that as early as you possibly can so you're not investing time and effort uh, in you know, building larger machine learning models or you know, deployment mechanisms for those models, deployment integrations, you know, first, uh, check for signal. So that's why those first two steps are, are most critical. I hope I answered that question, Debbie. It was a kind of a compound. Yeah, effort. yeah. No, I, I think that you did answer the question fine that usually in the RVA process, we will take, you know, a flat file. We don't have to have the integration because we're just looking for lift in the model and that, that we work on the implementation and the integration later on once we know that it's going to be successful and we could deploy that in any way that the client wants it deployed um, when we're doing the continuous data flow. That's exactly right, Debbie, right? That third, that module three, after you know you have signal in module three, then you build a more robust <laughs> machine learning model itself, do, you know, training, et cetera. We also have had clients that have just asked for quarterly insight as opposed to having the um, continuous feed. But um, mm -hmm. right. this is great. And the next question is just for Nick. Well, actually, it can be for anyone. But um, are there any challenges in using the same approach in a K through 12 educational institute? I mean, that's a great question, right? I mean, Obviously, you know, parts and pieces of this are not going to be quite the same. You know, it's like the alumni piece that, that Paul was, was referencing. But no, I mean, we've used this in K-12 just as, as rapidly as we've, we've done it in um, higher education. This process remains exactly the same, right? Because this is all about co-creation. We don't want to do it to you. We want to do it with you, right, is, as we're going forward. And the topic of student success, especially, especially now, right, as I talk to educators in the K through 12 space, higher education space, what they don't wanna do is they don't wanna say, we, we wanna, we're gonna look back 10 years from now and say, look, the classes of COVID times just weren't really up to it, right? And we've got to correct that. We've got to fix that. We've really got to do everything we can. So that whole student success piece, I think becomes incredibly, incredibly relevant in the K through 12 space. And from an administration standpoint, right? I mean, how do they get their dollars? They get their dollars from funding by being able to justify how many students have done all those kind of things. So yeah, I think, Debbie, this applies very, very much. It's very consistent. It's, it's very much the same sort of use cases as we've seen with our clients as we, we go through those conversations. So thank you for that question. Yeah, 
Terrific. So I think we're at the bottom of the take 30. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us and to remind you to just email us at hello AI at ironsidegroup.com. We'd love to get started. Typically that's with the use case discovery or the rapid viability assessment. Um, IBM and Ironside will team together to do whatever it takes to de-risk AI for you. And uh, thanks you for joining today. We will send out the, and have the video available as well. Mm -hmm. Take care and have a happy fourth. Bye all, thank you.